You saw me from afar and ran to meet me. You reached out your arms and I cried out for mercy. You took this broken heart and beautifully fixed. You gave me a new start Though I didn't deserve it You have set me free It's wonderful to be a new member of Transform tonight. I'm, I think I'm the 123rd member of Transform. <laughs> and then, after about an hour of this kind of conversation, rather intimate, warm conversation, suddenly Paddy changed conversational gear. And as an old politician, I recognised the gear he changed into. It was what politicians call a vote of thanks type speech. Because he cleared his throat, he said, <clears throat> John Owen, on behalf of the lads, I'd really like to thank you for these letters you've been writing for me and other people. And to show you how much I appreciate it, I've decided to give you a present. The present I'm going to give you is you can have, free of charge, mind you, you can have anything you like to choose from my library. And then he dived on the left-hand side of his bed and started rummaging around a tatty or cardboard box. And as he was rummaging, I wondered from that what, you know, learned tome, what presentation or volume is going to come out from underneath the bed of a man who can't read or write. And we finally rummaged them <laughs> And out came, and he spread them out in front of me, an amazing selection of hardcore porn magazines. <laughs> <laughs> and after, a, after a, a, a fleeting moment of temptation, uh, <laughs> I, I said, um, thanks, but no thanks, Paddy. <laughs> But I was just said it in a sort of tone of voice which was reverting to my old personality as a pompous politician. Because there was something about the way I said it that made Paddy flare up with great anger. And he said, oh, sneering at me, are you judging are you, me? Are you looking down on me? Are you? And um, anyway, I tried to intervene with this sort of uh, stream of invective. Um, and then he stopped himself with the most original idea of why I might have said no thank you. And he stopped, oh, he said, and if it's, but if it's boys you're after. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, uh, uh, no, it's not, uh, you know, I used to like those first kind of magazines. And he said, why you said no thank you then? I said, well, I was rather embarrassed to say this. And I said, well, if, if you really want to know, I'm trying a different path in life. Oh, what kind of path would that be then? So I said, well, if you, if you really want to know, it's the path of having a faith. It's the path of uh, uh, believing in Jesus. I tell you, it would take a long time to get round to the hero's story. It's a path, <laughs> path of believing, and he enters it in rather unpromising seconds. It's uh, a porn magazine. <laughs> it's, um, uh, that, um, you know, it's a path of, of faith. It's a path of believing in Jesus. It's a path of trying to follow his uh, commandments and teachings. Uh, and that's the path I'm on these days, and you know, it's changing my life. And suddenly there was a silence in that cell. I always remember that silence. It was sort of long, deep and meaningful silence. And after a long, long pause, it was broken by Paddy, who said something totally unexpected. And what he said was this. He said, you know, I I'd really like to try that path myself. And then before I could say anything much, a kind of floodgates burst open inside him, and I poured an avalanche of sort of questions, flashes of anger, but it's a muddle, but you could actually 
hear this in the most respectable parts of Brixton, apart from inside Brixton Prison, because the kind of things he was saying was this. He said, well, you know, I don't understand what life's all about. I don't know what it means. It doesn't seem to work very well. If it did, I wouldn't be in here. Um, my relationships don't work. Some to work. Some seem to work. Um, even when I got money in my pocket, of course he had an original way of getting it, but even so, um, even when I got money in my pocket, it doesn't work. Um, and um, I don't know what life's all about. I don't know what it means. I don't know what happens when we die. I don't happen. I don't sort of know how to steer in life. And then he said, but you know, my nan, she used to believe in all that Jesus stuff, and she sort of understood the meaning of life, and I've been watching you since you came in here, and you seem to know something about what it all means. So what does it all mean? And if there is a path, how do I get on the path? Will you help me get on the path? How do I get on the path? That's what he said. Well, there was another science in that. <clears throat> so, because I really didn't want to help him. I mean, the last thing I wanted to be some sort of preacher. Uh -huh. <clears throat> uh, but... Um, and finally, I said rather reluctantly, I said, well, you know, where I sort of got on this path, that um, uh, people started to uh, pray with me. And they said, oh, would, will you pray with me? <laughs> so I said, all right. So, and I had moved some way since I thought that, uh, you know, praying out loud was worse than going to the dentist without an anesthetic. I'd moved on. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I did pray with him, first night, second night, third night, fourth night, fifth night. And then Paddy started to say things like, oh, this stuff's too good just to keep to the two of us. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought he meant he was going to bring in another Irish burglar to make our twosome a threesome. <laughs> but Paddy was a young man of tremendous drive and energy, and indeed he would have made a good recruiting sergeant in the army in a different <laughs> era, because he rushed around the jail recruiting. And before we knew what had happened, he brought in a lot of very original recruits. Uh, to this, uh, he brought in a blagger, who some of you know is an armed robber. He brought in a kaito, who's an exotic kind of fraudster. He brought in a blower who cracked safes for a living. He brought in a couple more Irish burglars, a couple of lifers. Um, and before we knew where we were, we had a most unusual prayer group up and running. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it gave a, a completely new meaning to the Christian term, a cell group. <laughs> And being more serious for a moment, I'd like to tell you what happened in that cell group. Let me quickly say that I was not the leader of it. I was its greatest learner, greatest beneficiary. Um, and the way I remember what happened, just my way of remembering it, that the key things all began with the letter P. That's my after-the-event memory. But I'll just take you through them. Word number one beginning with P was pain. Now, of course, everyone has pain in their life. Sometimes it's deserved pain because of our own sins and mistakes. Sometimes it's completely undeserved pain, bereavement, broken relationships, illness, whatever it may be. But we all go through pain. How we go through pain is <clears throat> very, very important. Looking back on it, I think that we prisoners in that jail were, in some ways, a bit lucky. <clears throat> because we couldn't possibly, if we were going to be realistic and truthful, handle our pain <clears throat> the way most people in respectable society handle their pain. Because the way an awful lot of people handle their pain is to sort of pretend it's not happening at all. They deny it. They um, uh, conceal it. They bury it. They do the kind of things our culture teaches us to do, which is uh, keep a stuff up, stiff upper lip, you know, be a man, um, carry on, uh, pack up your troubles or old kit bag and smile, smile, smile. That's sort of, but we prisoners, for all the bad things we'd all done, nothing much more obvious in pain than a whole lot of men dressed up in prison uniform going through the misery of incarceration. So we didn't stop at the, you know, be in denial, pretend it's not happening stage. We leapt over that hurdle very fast. <clears throat> and then we started, uh, which was the purpose of it all, which is to pray. What is prayer? I've heard it in every imaginable language, phraseology, uh, uh, <clears throat> inarticulate, articulate. Um, but in the end, it's um, opening up a channel of listening and communicating with God, just like that girl in the miniskirt said in the, um, in the lecture at, uh, in the Alpha course. Um, and when you start to do that, things happen. 
And you must, uh, of course, be persistent and patient. To other words, which haven't been, a lot of people, especially in jail, think that um, you know prayer is some sort of shot of holy electrical energy, which will come down and solve your problems immediately. But it doesn't uh, sort of do that always. You don't have to patient. You have to wrestle with some of the um, uh, facts of prayer life, which is God's timing is not always your timing. Uh, prayers are sometimes unanswered for reasons we don't understand. It's not necessarily an easy road, but praying is very, very important. One of the first things you realize when you're on a journey of this kind is the importance of penitence, or to use another word, repentance. And that's difficult for lots of people. <clears throat> to um, What is repentance? I sometimes think our English language fails us a bit at this point. Because I think the word repentance, if you sort of think, oh, what do people associate with repentance? <clears throat> they associate sort of saying sorry all over again, repeatedly, um, you know, maybe standing in the corner um, uh, in the old days wearing sackcloth and ashes. Um, it's all got rather negative connotations. But in the original Greek language, which the Gospels are written in, um, the uh, word for repentance is metanoia, which literally means meta, a change, noia of mind, best translated as a change of heart and mind, a sort of big change. <clears throat> and that's what repentance is really all about. Of course, in a prison, people are very often cynical <coughs> about people who say they have suddenly um, feeling repentant or feeling sorry. Oh, how very convenient when parole reports are being written next month on you, and this kind of thing. <laughs> uh, but there is a test. I mean, first of all, God knows whether we are truly what's going on in our hearts anyway. But there's a real test, which you can find in Matthew chapter 3, verse 8, and I think that's two other Gospels, and it's John the Baptist talking in the early days of his ministry. And he says, show the fruits of your repentance. And in other words, if you genuinely are changing your heart and mind, the fruits of it will show up. And I remember as this prayer group got going and grew in numbers, being absolutely astonished, oh me of little faith, the kind of things which went on in it. Uh, these tough young men um, started, for example, to stop swearing, which is a miracle in a prison. <coughs> they, some of them threw away their porn magazines. Uh, some of them uh, started to be kind to the pariah prisoners on the wing, like the sex offenders. Um, some of them started to be very polite to one another and respectful to the prison officers, which they hadn't always been. I think the biggest single thing was the young men who had troubles with um, drugs. And uh, they suddenly started to face up to this and then to make the effort to become clean and stay clean. And that brings me to the second last word in my P sequence, which is power. Because there are some things you can't do by your own power. And here the hero of the story really starts to get going. Um, but there's an interesting crossroads. I think somebody mentioned it tonight. Uh, the crossroads between <clears throat> the secular and the spiritual about power. Because those of you who know the first thing about Alcoholics Anonymous courses or uh, Narcotics Anonymous courses will know that they consist of 12 steps. And somewhere along the line, of course, says you may not be able to get to step number 10, or whatever it is. You may need the help of a higher power. And the secular courses just leave it dangling. But we in this prayer group, which was after all directed to God, uh, uh, I think we knew what we were talking about. We knew that we couldn't clean up our bits of our messy lives um, by our own willpower. We needed the help of a higher power, and that meant God's power. Perhaps I should just go a little deeper at the stage <clears throat> when talking about God's power. Um, after I um, came out of prison, I am... Um, took an unusual career move. I went to the one place in Britain which had worse food than a prison and worse plumbing than a prison. This was a Church of England theological college called Wycliffe Hall, Oxford. <coughs> there I studied and got a degree in theology for the next years. But, and while I was there, 
we had to write essays every week on sort of spiritual and doctrinal subjects. And one of the questions for the essay was, uh, please explain the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, the three-in-one God. You'll be very relieved here. I'm not going to explain it <coughs> to you now. I'm not sure I ever understood it academically, but I really understood it in that prayer group, and I'll tell you why. As I listened to the prayers of my fellow prisoners, and of course said plenty myself, um, some of them prayed regularly to God the Father. Why? Because like some of those giving their short testaments tonight, they um, had never had a father. They longed for a rock of paternal trust uh, and that foundation stone of their lives. And that's what they longed for. So they began their praise. Oh, Father God, Heavenly Father, our Father. That's how they began. Others uh, wanted the things that Jesus stands for. Love, compassion, mercy, forgiveness of sinners, healing. They prayed to God the Son, O oh Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. And that's how they began their prayers. And others wanted that mysterious third person of God, the Holy Spirit, who Jesus left behind when he uh, ascended uh, to heaven, saying, I'm going to leave behind different words are used in different passages of the Bible. Comforter, parakletos, the one who comes alongside. Um, the Holy Spirit, he who will empower you to do things you've never ever begin to do. And so this mysterious combination of <clears throat> God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, very present in our prayer group, which had some remarkable effects. <coughs> Of course, it wasn't all miracle time. Some people walked out, some people thought it was nonsense. But there was a sort of core group meeting night after night after night, praying together, reading the Bible together. And they, I must dig out one or two addresses. I was still in touch with them because um, they um, were transformed. Um, they really changed in the ways I've been talking about. And no one was more transformed than Paddy. Um, who really gave his life to the Lord, who, um, uh, flashing blue lights, I hope not looking for anyone here. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, people were transformed by this, and, and we've heard such marvelous stories tonight. I needn't tell you what the word transform means. It just means big change, and nobody more so than uh, Paddy. And Paddy became, he gave his life to the Lord. He did all the things I've been talking about. He threw away the porn magazines. He stopped swearing. He was estranged from his wife. He got in touch with her. Um, he um, uh, became a sort of changed and model person. The biggest thing he did, he, had, he was a heroin addict, a bad one. And he stopped it and he fought this battle. Uh, and he won the battle. He, uh, and this was, praise God, it was absolutely marvelous. Um, I sometimes worry when I get to the end of a talk like this <clears throat> whether I've connected up with anybody at all in the audience. I know I've connected up with a few people because they've been on this journey. But, um, uh, and what worries me is that maybe people think that um, this is all a sort of story about other people. A uh, whole lot of prisoners in a jail. It's not really for them. What <clears throat> is, is the meaning of this story? Um, and I have some sympathy for people who say that, by the way, because I think if I heard it, I'd probably say perhaps it was quite an interesting story, a few good jokes in it, but um, it doesn't really have anything to do with my life. Well, it does for this reason. I think the one thing that sort of very respectable people very often have in common with people who have fallen from grace and are in prison is that both sets of people are very set in their ways. They're very small c conservative. They don't want to do this kind of thing I'm talking about, go on a spiritual journey, join a prayer group, go to an alpha course, read the Bible, pray in groups, pray out loud. They really don't like the idea of this. So what does it take to get them going? Um, well, uh, first of all, 
I think don't be afraid of life's adversities. <clears throat> they can be the turning points. Um, I think it was Martin Luther who said, it is our, in our pain and our brokenness that we come closest to Christ. Uh, and that's the moment of all. But I'll end <clears throat> with what may appear at first to be a funny story, but you'll get the message of it. And it's a story actually about Paddy. As I say, Paddy became the most um, enthusiastic uh, new Christian imaginable. <clears throat> and there was one uh, uh, unusual symptom of this, apart from the other things I've described, like him giving up his drugs and so on. One uh, afternoon he popped up in the prayer group and said, you know, I've been thinking and I've been worrying, and um, one of the things I've been worrying about is my family, and I've never done anything but, but trying to bring them up in a Christian way. <clears throat> How could I? I wasn't a Christian myself. But um, my wife, I'm now reconciled with, um, she gave me the great news that she's pregnant. And um, this, this sort of, since I came to Genesis four or five months ago, this has all happened and I'm so excited. And my uh, new baby's going to be born in a few weeks. And I've already been to the chaplain to ask whether uh, he will baptize her in the, uh, in the chapel. Um, a ch I Chaplain was a bit surprised to be asked to baptize a baby who hadn't been born yet. But <coughs> <laughs> anyway, um, and by this time we were, we were all in an open prison, things were a bit easier. So, lo and behold, after some discussion, we were able to have the baptism service. Of, uh, 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 he was a Catholic, so it was done according to the Catholic traditions. But um, of Paddy's newborn daughter in the prison chapel. And I remember that. Um, uh, baptism service for as long as I live for a variety of reasons, some of them humorous, some of them emotional, some of them deeply spiritual. Get the humorous ones out of the way first. Uh, Paddy, who had not totally lost his cunning, even though he'd become a um, good Christian, uh, managed to get delivered to the prison uh, a box containing, I think, 12 bottles of liquid. Uh, <laughs> uh, and of course they were not immediately allowed in. Um, but Paddy said um, they were uh, for the baby's refreshment during the... Um, <laughs> <coughs> and there was a rather decrepit old uh, prison officer um, who wearily said, it's an awful lot of bottles for a baby's christening. What do you do, you know, uh, <coughs> baptizing? Uh, and Paddy quickly said, sir, sir, she's a very thirsty baby, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think of those 12 bottles, at least sort of three of them contain neat vodka, so an absolutely fantastic party was had, but that's another story. The other humorous thing about the uh, baptism service was the baby's dress. Um, as soon as I saw this baby in her dress, I said, this is a christening dress worthy of a princess. Yards and yards of expensive flowing white silk, um, wonderful sort of designs and bows and ruffles all over it could have been made by Dior or Balenciaga or Stella McCartney. It was absolutely magnificent. <coughs> and, um, uh, and then as I looked a little more closely, I suddenly realized that actually this was not a baby's christening dress. It was an adult lady's bridal gown. <laughs> And if I'd had to guess which particular lorry it had fallen off the back of, <laughs> I would have guessed quite quickly that it had fallen off the back of a lorry on the way to the outsize woman shop. Uh, because uh, it was a ginormous, uh, uh, I mean, you know, made for a double bride, or made, made for a Wagnerian soprano or something. Uh, and as soon as this tiny little baby was lowered into this vast, uh, ginormous lady's bridal gown. She looked like a tiny little boat being launched into huge billowing white waves. And the inevitable happened, the boat capsized. Uh, not once, but several times. And as the good Catholic priest got going on the baptism service, suddenly the baby slid off into the right hand side and completely vanished from sight. And uh, Paddy's new best friends, all of them member of the prayer group, rushed forward and in the nicest kind of rescued the baby, pulled her out, uh, uh, saying things like, God bless you, my darling, give a kiss. And there she was, a bang in the center of the uh, bridal gown, and then whoops, she shot him down. <laughs> and the whole process started over again. Before we knew where we were, we had a real audience participation service. People coming, going, pulling the baby out. 
<laughs> and uh, centering it down. And um, anyway, as I watched this, at first, like some of you, I was sort of superficially amused. Um, and then I, next thing I started to do was to feel terribly sorry for the baby who was having a rough time. Whoops, she was on the left hand side <laughs> and being pulled out. And, um, and I felt very protective towards this tiny little baby for a rather special reason. Paddy had done me the great honor of uh, asking me to be uh, a godfather of the Christian variety um, <coughs> to, this, uh, <laughs> uh, to this small baby. So I, I felt honored by that, but, and I really felt sort of very protective towards this poor little baby. But so did everyone else in the chapel. Um, I've never been in a service which there was more love, more kindness, these guys sort of holding the little babies, pressing a tiny little hand, God bless me, just going on like this. And I started to be moved. And then I started to have a spiritual thought, and it was this, and it all comes back to the word transformed. I said, what is happening here? Uh, here we are, a whole lot of uh, criminals in a jail, um, we were instantly, it was happening about a week before Christmas 1999. And so, and this, somehow the sort of metaphor of this innocent young uh, child, newborn child, whose innocence contrasted very sharply with the uh, lack of innocence with everyone else in the room. And yet, these guys who'd uh, done such bad crimes were behaving almost angelically. They were rushing forward, they were saying these prayers. And I said to myself, why, you know? These fingers, these hands who today, you know, praying over the baby, touching her little hand, being so gentle, so soft. These were hands who a few months ago had uh, fingers on triggers, uh, outstretched hands in drug deals, fights, violence. And yet there they are behaving <coughs> so softly, so gently, so prayerfully. Why? Because they have changed. Because they have been transformed. Who has transformed them? The person who's been transforming people for 2,000 odd years, our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, who was always transforming people. Mary Magdalene, the prostitute, um, Zacchaeus, the corrupt businessman, Saul of Tarsus, murderously stoning people one moment, Paul the great apostle the next. That is Jesus' um, power for us, that he transforms us. But we have to make the first move. And I'll end this uh, talk before I just say one last thing. It's my prayer. Whenever I look at an audience, I don't know who's in it, but I say, I just pray there's one person here tonight who will say to themselves what Paddy said to himself that day when we were having coffee. You know, I'd really like to try that path myself. If you were here, starting with the pastors, who would love to help you, I pray that there will be somebody who will want to try and get on that path themselves, because as I know, the path to transformation is the greatest and the most blessed path that you can find in this life. God bless you all and thank you. You saw me from afar And ran to me You reached out your arms And I cried out for mercy You took this broken heart And beautifully fixed it You gave